All right, you guys, on this episode, it is the holidays. We are talking a little about some travel tips for training. And Jesse just and I just happen to be wearing our, uh, you can't see any of these, got these, uh, the Travelers from Strike. These are my favorite shoes to travel in. Uh, and uh, not sponsored, even though that sounded like a sponsor. Yeah, it did sound like did a sponsor. It, they're just so We'll comfy. reach out to Mark. <laughs> Shout out. Uh, we are talking about our travel tips, uh, training in the airports. How, what's the best training technique for the airports? And a ton of travel tri- travel tips for training woo, in transit on the plane. So some good hacks there. Justin finds some uh, pigeons in the bathroom <laughs> on the flight. I think he brought them. Actually. And horses in the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we talk about back squats and how to optimize your back squat for range of strength, the value of range of strength. If you don't know what that is, um, skip to the end or listen all the way through. And then our holiday plans. All this and more on this valuable episode of The Outrun Show. Love on the back. Thick of a heel. Yeah. So I do find that this heel needs to break in a bit. It's kind of yeah. stiff. Whereas the last ones were like good to go from start, yeah but these ones you kind of need to break in a little bit. they do feel a little roomier the, i would say that the felt ones that i had in the past felt a little more cozy did you mm-hmm. have the felt ones they felt super cozy but yeah they just got so dirty i had to yep I, I was just like i got to, i gotta retire these i spilled um cooking oil on them Ooh. when that never came off so it just looked like i was walking around walking around with these filthy shoes mm-hmm. hey because there's like the dark stain on the top mm-hmm. grossness yeah. Well, this episode Which, of what, uh, the Outrun Show is sponsored by Sensu Beans. Sensu Beans. What you got there, Jesse? Mm, some Dragon Ball Z Sensu Beans. Some candy. Beans. <laughs> it's like, it's beans. If you can buy Sensu Beans online, we're testing out to see if there is any sort of like nootropic effects. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm eating. Um, I'm eating Zero. multiples of them. So <laughs> hopefully their effects stack. Yes. Also, can't chew them like they did in those shows. Well, they were crunchy really in the shell. Yeah, but those aren't crunchy. Those are rocks. Yeah, they're <laughs> impossible. Uh, that's what's good. It's, you gotta you gotta give the sensu bean juices time to soak into your bloodstream. <laughs> what do they call that? It's like time lapse. Time, not time lapse. Uh, uh, there's a term for that when you buy a pill that can uh, slowly oh, dissolve. Um, oh. Yeah, we gotta talk about some other company. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, time release. Yeah, no, there's an actual term for it. Cause really? It's not lozenge. It's like, yeah, that goes into your tongue. Yeah. And then uh, they sit there. Yeah. yeah. There's a, a medical, or I guess a pharmaceutical term for it. Yeah. It, what? It, okay. Well, it will come to us. Yes. I remember having to do it for my cats. <laughs> Put stuff on your tongue? <laughs> yeah. Squirt stuff into their cheeks. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. The pain medicine does that. Mm. Huh. No, Did you yeah. just crunch that? Uh-huh. See? We <laughs> got Goku to eat. Sensu bean. Do you guys right now, one of my favorite videos to watch on uh, Styles on TikTok is where they take like MMA fights and they just like, oh, you know, like edit that. over like their, uh, um, the, like animations. The finishers? Yeah, the finishers. Did you send that to us? I think a while back I sent you one, but I've you watched mean, like, it. like they add like the, like the, or- the key yeah. auras and stuff like yes. that around them? Yeah. Uh, or like one edit somebody had uh, yesterday was like some guy caught another guy's foot and I don't know who the athletes were and the dude throws a back kick to his like head and he kind of like just is like knocked out and stunned with his arms out as he starts to fall over so he just turns to ice and then like falls on the ground and then he breaks apart oh yeah like I was like it's dang cool. somebody put some time in on that yeah. but it is cool or like they'll replace like the people's fists with like Thor hammers and stuff yeah I saw the Thor dude sometimes the Thor. I, Thor cool. I come across those things and I'm like wow this guy was really bored. Dude, this girl was like, you know what? I'm just going to edit this stuff because you know what? I got nothing better to do. Yeah. The talent on TikTok for free is just blowing my mind right now. Like those edits, they're, they're just, they're made for like a little phone and you just have to know so much to get them done and no one's paying you. Like if there was a budget for that and like you went to some contractor or some company, some agency and said, yeah, I want to take his MA fighters. And he's going to be like Thor, and this guy's going to be like Sub-Zero. This guy's going to be like Goku. 
They'd be like, uh huh, yeah, and ten thousand, okay, and ten thousand, uh huh, uh huh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. and you'd come out, and they'd be like, cool, we can do that project for you. It's forty grand, you know. It's, yep. And someone just in their basement is like, look what I did. Doesn't even know that they could sell that skill set. Well, I mean, if I'm being honest, they're they're probably rolling that stuff into some sort of portfolio. If they're being smart, they're. Gonna, I mean, honestly, <laughs> Colin says no. Uh, well, that's just that's just on them. I've legit, I agree. Agree. I've agreed. legit gone to a business that I've seen like a roof gap on, and been like, I want to jump that roof gap, and then going to the to the business and asking like, Hey, like you guys have this really cool thing. I want to I want to do it. Can I do it? Here's my Instagram. Mm. You can see that I'm a legit professional, and they can scroll through my Instagram profile and see like my clips, and they'll be like, Yeah, sure. Whereas, like, if I just went in, you know, you gotta, you gotta bring some clout to the table. That's a good and, idea. Like, your profile, could, your profile is your clout, right? Like, that's, right. It's true. So. And if you got midday clout, that's legit. So if you, yeah. So if you, uh, if you just put all that stuff on your TikTok profile while you're cool edits, and then you go for a job interview, you can just yeah. pull it up on the table and be like, "Yo, check out all the stuff I've done." Yeah, you'd impress me. That's and then, true. and then you just watch the interviewer sit and go into a TikTok hole <laughs> during the interview, and then you know you've got the job. And just get the hypnosis uh, TikTok, and then just be like, "I am hired. You are hired. Your pay is doubled. Your pay is doubled." <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. We have some background noise today with the garage doors and wind. Uh, the weather is Wyoming today. Mm-hmm. It is very windy today. A lot of people think Wyoming, they, they see Wyoming TikTok and they think like Jackson Hole. They think, you know, national park, you know, bears and mountains and beautiful environment. Wyoming is a desolate plain that literally just has 60 mile an hour winds on it nonstop. Like it just, you would like, why are there no, why is it the like, wait, the lowest um, populated state, right? Yeah. There's... There's only like a couple hundred thousand people. Yeah, less than 500. So I think it's four ish. <laughs> it's, yeah, there's. And it's not small. It's, no, it's not. It's very big. Because there are really only certain parts of Wyoming that are actually inhabitable. And the rest <laughs> is Mars. So all these people, like, they're like, oh, you know, Elon's moving to Texas. He should have moved to Wyoming if he wants to be so close to Mars. Because, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is the least populated state. Yeah. How many people? Four hundred and fifty. I want to say thirty. Four thirty. Four thirty. Let's see. Wyoming population scroll, is five hundred and seventy-nine thousand. Oh, they've increased. <laughs> they must have been those Californians. Like everyone's complaining about. <laughs> yeah, going from California to Wyoming is quite a culture shift there. Yeah. So. Exactly. Ah, but speaking of travel, yes, it's the uh, we're coming up on the holidays now. Um, the big holidays. Hey, sir, stop reading about Wyoming now. TikTok hole. <laughs> <laughs> You're trapped in the Wyoming TikTok. That won't last long. That's the only hole I would not be afraid of getting out of. It would <laughs> quickly lose its allure. But travel. But yeah. So are are you guys traveling at all for the holidays? Hmm. You're no. staying. You're staying. No, there's a yeah, there's a pandemic. <laughs> Seemed like the right thing to say. Yeah. I'm traveling, but not for the holidays, post holidays. Where are you going? Uh Arizona. Family? No. Just Well, well, well we there's have, no one. We do have family in Arizona, yeah. but that's not the primary reason to head well, What's in there. Arizona? This is news to us. What? Cheap flights, cheap, cheap hotels, and it's warm. That also the warm part that'll get me right about now since mm-hmm. since it's Wyoming outside right now. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty cold. So we uh, well we had um, flights because we were gonna go visit um, Angus in uh, Kansas City. Mm. So we were, and then this was back in April, and of course we had the big old closure. So we canceled those flights, and we had to redeem them at some point. Mm. So we were like, well, let's just book somewhere random. So we kind of dartboarded the United States. And if it was cold, we dartboarded again. <laughs> and ended up on kind of Arizona. So, yeah. So, we'll be in Phoenix for about a week or so. Yeah. Be nice. You guys should head up the drive to Phoenix to Flagstaff. Is, like, covering a couple different planets in, like, an hour drive. It's oh, freaking we've, we've driven to Driving Arizona, to Arizona is pretty crazy. many times. Mm. And I'm a flight guy. Like, I don't like, I hate road trips. 
I think when I was younger, I didn't have a choice. Wow, that's, that wind <laughs> is extreme. And we are quite literally the, the broad side of a barn here. In fact, <laughs> two broad sides of barns yeah. um, over here for the wind to just slam right into. So apologies for the background noise. It's literally shaking the garage door mechanisms. <laughs> that's crazy. So, well, that's a good reason to fly out. So I'll wait for the wind to die down and you're going out. So when, when we travel, uh, we are, we're, we're a bit weird in that you get really antsy in airports and we actually like to, we know you're about to get on a long flight. Any flight feels like a long flight, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, so we're trying to stay active in airports. So the, the, uh, the question is, how do you guys train in airports? In the, the way that freaks people out the most. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Which is just about any sort yep. of movement any in an airport. Movement besides actually, sitting and walking, yeah, they do not like. It's uh, I, I, I always call it the the muggle shuffle, when you get into like airports. So if you just like walk, you just see, especially when there's like lines of people waiting for the gate. It's like people just do this like. Oh yeah, sh sh yeah. Sh I call that the muggle shuffle, and it's I'm like, just depressing. pick a direction and go. I don't care if that direction is the right direction or not, but like I, I'm like the guy in the crowd that's like leaning side to side trying to look over people. I'm like, are you? Is there something in your way? Was what's happening here? Like, <laughs> as people just kind of mindlessly shuffle. So yeah. So if you do anything outside of the ordinary, that's kind of weird. I really always wanted to do a handstand up the return. Uh, so when you get back uh, from a flight and you land in Denver, mm -hmm. and you have that giant escalator after the off the tram after the tram. I've always wanted to handstand up that the whole time because everyone is so packed in there tight and no one walks. So you're you're sitting on that you know escalator for like a whole minute it feels like, and uh, I always wanted to just do a handstand so I could clear myself some room. Because <laughs> <laughs> so like, oh, people's not gonna go underneath you if you're doing the handstand. Which up. which one are you talking about? The big one, you know, where people wait with the signs after their like, oh, family members get back. That, es oh, that escalator. That escalator. Yeah, because it's escalator. ridiculously long. very packed. You'd have a tough time getting yep. in that position. Because people would try and pretend like you're not handstanding and then try and like push in on you, but then they would kind of have the I just cannot that just blows my mind about how people will ignore whatever's happening around them no matter what it is, as if it's not happening. You see people do tricks, you see people do stunts, and people just walk by and it's not even looking at their phone. They're just like they're highly aware of where what you're doing, but they're trying to pretend like they're not involved or something. Just take a moment That's to definitely be impressed. The business like New York crowd, I feel like. Yeah. That's where I saw it the worst. Where I literally could uh, ask someone and talk to them and make eye contact and they just walk right past me. Right? I've, I'm that yeah. way. I've gotten that way with yeah. most random people. But in New York, you have to be that way. You can't no walk around people. New York when yeah. you pay attention. Yeah, without getting accosted. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so I feel like it's a, it's a little different uh, in Fort Collins. They don't get that as much. But at DAA, you'll certainly get it. D the You have done the handstand on the conveyor, just not that conveyor. Yeah, I've done handstand yes. But yeah, it was on the, for on sure. the, the horizontal one, right? Yep. Not that tall escalator. I think I've done one on an escalator, too. It's a little scarier no, knowing that it could eat me. Yes. Oh, uh, dude, you just get to the top <laughs> and it just chews your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> like, it still freaks me out. How? Oh, yes. It's and basically then, a monster. I think in, in BC, Jesse, you did the escalator slide at one point, I want to say. Maybe it was Singapore. I can't remember but I remember you sliding down. Oh yeah, down the down the side. I think yeah, that, I think that was Singapore. On the silver side, yeah. Because I think I remember Eric just cracking up. Yes, and in Singapore you could have been like Kane for that or something. Yeah. But truly, the cameras had their eyes on you. After that, the uh, is it just caning or is it a fine too? So I don't know. They're just really like strict. That's, no that's worse than yeah. in America to get a fine. They just get all cane a couple times. Oh, it's just like, oh, no, it. Well, what's worse is getting caned and then having to pay and for then the cane. Fine. Yeah, I don't even know if they the still fine, do it's worse. caning <laughs> in Singapore. Like I don't even know if that's a thing. I think it's still on the books, but I don't think. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah we'll have to research that. Hey, we you at Colin? Just a side note. Let's see if caning still a thing in Singapore. The I think it's still legal. Yeah, but you just it's like what is it, like it's illegal to own like an ostrich in Florida or some like those weird laws that pop up around that nobody's like actually looked at in some 60 years i don't i i think you can actually get cane <laughs> in singapore i think it's a government punitive 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I think it's on the books, but I don't know if anybody actually Man, does. It. What's the verdict? It says it's a mandatory punishment for a bunch of really bad things, as well as foreigners who overstay <laughs> by more than 90 days. <laughs> uh, I think that one's hilarious. <laughs> Like you are now a partial citizen. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And that part of your flesh will stay here forever. Yeah. On this cane. Yeah. <laughs> Spill your blood upon the soil. Yeah. Yeah, I was always impressed in Singapore, uh, like the the um like you just don't see homeless people, you don't see any you don't see anyone who doesn't seem like they're kinda of part of the flow there. Yeah, that's like in the city proper. We never really went outside of the city, but yeah. That's true. Yep. Pretty much everybody's doing something. We don't know. I kind of just think that they probably just ship people to Malaysia. They're just like, yeah, it's not working out. Bye. So, uh, other training in the uh, uh, in the airport. I always loved stretch before I get on the plane. So usually I'll be doing like pancake stretch, you know, mm-hmm. bow stance, horse dance. We were talking about yep. the value of horse dance. One of the greatest things about horse dance is that you can pack it up and take it anywhere. It is if you brought both of your legs with you. If you brought both, actually, your legs. even if you brought one, you could lean against the wall and technically still get into a horse dance. Mm-hmm. So, and I don't do horse dance as much. I feel like that one makes people think I'm in martial arts if it's just horse dance. I'll do. Uh, that's, that's a good question. So, I like martial arts not the like, you know, I can't have your elbows tucked into the side. And that's what I feel like people. Oh, you would chamber, like <laughs> yeah. chamber, and then start just doing punches yeah. in the corner. So I'll do like I would laugh. I feel like at I'll do like seventy five percent splits, metal splits, and I have my hands on my hips, so it, no people don't think I'm like meditating or something. But I still think that's horse dance. Yeah, I, I mean, I I would consider it. But, but you're thinking like you know, kid. yeah, Karate Kid, horse dance, which is yeah. horrible horse dance actually. Mm. But the there aren't any bad horse dances, but that's definitely one of them. Um, you're thinking like yeah, like the southern guys who do the thing with the fingers over the to the elbows and they yeah. shoot their fingers out. <laughs> that would be great. In the airport, yeah, security would be called real quick. I've actually done quite a bit of stuff in an airport. I've never had the security called on me. Mm. Or uh, one of my best friends jumping on the the little uh, golf carts and the lady yelling at him, doing double kongs over the. Uh, the moving walkways, mm. handstands, running up the down escalator. Uh, yeah, I've never had this. I mean, well, I'm white, so. <laughs> <laughs> Very yeah. hipster, non-threatening. Short. Yeah, short guys. <laughs> and they're like, well, this guy's obviously not a threat to people. There's yeah, a kid he's over gone. there doing handstands. Ma'am, I'm 30. <laughs> there, is- <laughs> <laughs> there is something about, like, the, the like, energy of an airport that's yeah. so, like, for, for us, it's very energizing, right? Like, when I get into an airport, I want uh-huh. to, like, like trick on, like, the open areas. Mm-hmm. And before the gate, I want to, like, flip off the benches and do all sorts of stuff, right? And I think it's, like, in reaction to the just oppressive, uh-huh. like, muggle energy. That's just it's just a big there. open space, too. And there's just so much, like, I mean, everything's built to just be sturdy there, mm-hmm. right? So it's like, oh, yeah, like everything can be climbed on in here. And everybody's so like weirdly depressed, even though the ability to travel is one of the coolest things that like humanity's ever made. And these people have the audacity to be sad in here. Mm. And so it's like it's like a reaction to that. that I, just I think everybody is really is afraid of flying. So they're just like kind of anxious that way too. Maybe. People are afraid of flying? I think a lot of people are afraid of flying. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would guarantee that like probably 90 percent of the people who are there are anxious well, about that flight. There's a lot of people. I bet it's the vast majority. Really? Just because of but not having people a... got into a car to get to the airport. Right. It's not logical. Which is like, well, it's pretty logical. Hundred times more likely to die in that that statistically. Trip to the right. The data is the only thing that makes me feel good about it. Wow. But yeah, I am. I have no. Clue. And then some acclimation. So more flying. The people who fly as part of commute and stuff too. Hmm. Like they'll be really interesting. But in Denver, they have the like Aztec. Mm-hmm. You know, stop. I always want to just like get in ex- Indiana Jones, explore that. That one area is really cool. Because they had so, like, the train goes underneath and then around the outside it's built up and there's like stones and moss and stuff like that. And you just want to go and play on it. Are you talking about DIA conspiracy theories? <laughs> DIA has has very leveraged very well their conspiracy yeah. theories. Yeah. They've done a really <laughs> good job with it. The talking it. gargoyle was awesome. It talked? 
He talked. Yeah, there was a guy at the microphone on the other end. No just, way. Just dissed everybody who walked by. Because <laughs> <laughs> they'd stop and they'd be like, and then they'd look at it, and then the guy would be on the speaker and be like, what are you looking at? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all these conspiracy theories that, that DIA was built over some, what, like, secret yeah, underground, like, complex. underground complex of Illuminati has Illuminati. Lizard yeah. people, or yeah, it's like it, it, you'll find either Nazis, Illuminati, lizard people, gargoyles that are possessed. Yeah, the art is a little strange, but I think they're just doubling down on it because yeah. they think it's funny. It yeah. is funny. I think part of it is just we're just a little unaccustomed to uh, the art from more indigenous people. <laughs> mm. uh, the because the main mural that gets all the flack is some like I think some Mexican artist, and he had a very very lengthy post about what each symbol meant mm. and so there was there's some very direct um yeah meaning behind all that and mm. i think when you look at it you see a person in a gas mask with a gun and you, you people just start making assumptions but yeah and it's what's tough is that really usually when you have these big budget projects art that's the only time that art kind of makes its way into things because there has to be a big enough budget and it has to be usually a community project, which means some element of it needs to be dedicated to making sure that it's ingrained in the community. Yeah. And so they have that's the only time art can sneak in and get paid in a lot of ways. That's true. If we had it, if we had just art budgets for society, which would no one would endorse in this current climate, um, then yeah, you would end up with places where you could just go and experience art. You know, either museums or just in cities proper. Some of them do have programs like that, but. Yeah, they kind of, it's almost like the government has to inject it in, like the city has all the painted electrical boxes, which I think is super cool, mm-hmm. but, mm-hmm. you know, like that's where you, you get your art integration. Has well, no, sad, it has to be so forced, but right, has it's kind of no cool that it happens played, at all. Played like any of the uh, simulators for building like uh, uh, societies, right? Like Sims, like those simulators. Those. There's no art. There's no art. In those. There's like no art. Like no, it's like yeah. your culture, like, but you get like certain points, like your culture won't, or your society won't behave a particular way without artistic elements or libraries placed. I remember some games like that. Oh, past. really? Yeah. Were you at where they actually wouldn't let you progress unless there was like a flourishing culture in your society? It wasn't just about, but now all those games are on mobile and it's just like, how many tanks can you build to like annihilate <laughs> the, the giants that are attacking your city on the, drax, on the backs of dragons? Yeah. Stuff like that. They get pretty intense. But speaking, so airports, we're, we're digressing on the art now, but. Yeah, what's ask. your best airport, airport exercise? Because I'm yeah. going to say it's horse stand. Yeah, I'm usually doing front splits and side splits and handstands. I will do a B twist and probably kick the moon. If, the, if there's enough space. You it's not that easy. Yeah. Uh, I pretty much just sleep. <laughs> That's also very rare, actually. Like, if you're, are you laying down when you're sleeping? Oh yeah, on the floor. I'll straight up yeah. sleep under the benches. Just yeah. Sleep. People are like, oh gosh, this guy, he's like sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I do a lot of pancake. Uh, sometimes I'll do legs up the wall. Like if I have an open wall by the gate, <laughs> I just do legs up the wall. No. And then I put my backpack on my on my chest, and then I prop my phone up there. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've seen that. You say he's not making this up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Full like hoodie, hood over, legs up the wall, like in the V, backpack on chest, hand up. Yeah, that's the that's the way you, you kill long, long layovers. Yeah, I think that you've got to hit the, um, probably the hip flexors a little bit though too, because you're just sitting. You can't like get into that, unless you can cross your legs in a plane. I got some longer femurs, but a little tougher, but it's, it's going to be good to get that. I think, yeah, maybe... The pancake and then and then like a split squat to open open up the hip flexors because you're gonna yeah. be sitting for some time yeah depending on your flight and that's always like the worst part is that you know you're going to be sitting for so long and athletes know how much damage that does like the next almost it's like i feel like it's a 48 hour window after your flight if you didn't prep properly or not at least like getting up and walking around on the plane that Dude, there's you so feel much that effect. stuff that is happening to your body on a flight that's bad for you that those long flights so the last flight that we were on together was that singapore flight 16 and a half hours yeah after a flight to like sf or la i can't remember which one it was it was my sf from denver yeah and that was 16 hours and i remember thinking to myself i could just go insane here this is not 
It is, yeah, it's a long time to be in, like, a dimly lit tube mm-hmm. with, like, tons of other bodies, for sure. But I'm, like, a little guy, so, like, I just sit yeah. on the floor and cross my legs, and then I just use the chair to mm, spin around. Yeah, and and until the, like, like, lady is like, hey, you got to be in your seatbelt, in which case then I do the squat, and I buckle around my ankles, <laughs> <laughs> and then I fall asleep. I've never that. thought of using that to create, like a like, a table for me to sleep on, but, yeah. The strap in. Well, you, yeah, you might be a little too tall for it, but I'm gonna try it next time for, for sure. Definitely. I mean, you can't take his advice if you don't change your socks every day. But taking your shoes off in the plane is pretty amazing. Yeah, pretty. But if you are not, if you don't have a pair of socks for every day of the week, don't do it. I do not want to be near you. Well, also, just like you could have a pair of socks for flight, flight socks. Yeah. Yeah. Very it, good idea. Mm-hmm. That'd be the kind. But thing I also do. wash my feet every flight. To, in, to stretch my hip flexors. In the sink. Oh, Wait. yeah. What? Okay. This Yo, is why I don't here. touch those sinks. Like, I just know, man. It's like I'm all elbows in there, just like, ah, I'll use a paper towel to touch everything in here. I mean, so he was in here doing he did, handstands, washing his feet. He did specifically say that he was washing them. He's not like, I just put my feet up the on bathroom The bathroom is the so. best place to stretch. Like, yeah, but just you're just like, in there doing pigeon. You know? <laughs> In the sink, like but a don't, pigeon. Don't do it on the sink though. Just take the, the the baby chaining station that goes over the toilet. You put that one down, and then you can go into pigeon on top of that guy yeah. and just prop your elbows up and like you know. I always imagine people are just in there with IBS, and instead I'm waiting outside, and somebody in there like you trying to do yoga session, <laughs> yeah. like a hot yoga. You can't mile do high it club. in the middle of the aisle. Like it's yeah. just so. I mean, sometimes I feel like uh, I I think I got permission to stretch in the like little flight attendant corridor right section once um but yeah really it's like i don't want everyone staring at me while i'm stretching so and watching your feet feels amazing i don't know if you've <laughs> done that in the middle of the day <laughs> like, <laughs> mother is blown you can't uh, it you doesn't, doesn't not, surprise me falling to sleep after watching your feet is just like i don't know what it is about it but it's so, so hold on easy. you are you do you put your socks back on yeah, Let's dry them off and, and put okay. them back on. Yeah. You didn't just like walk back to your chair with like <laughs> soggy socks. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, no, I I do think though like there are uh, there are a ton of like tips on the flight for staying mobile, but they all involve other people looking at you weird. Mm-hmm. And look, that's just the price you got to pay to walk off that plane. That's right. Feeling okay about yep. your, like yeah. your body. Because otherwise, no. And people that are like, oh, no, I could fly 12 hours and, like, walk off the plane and feel fine are, like, the people who, like, operate at 60% potential exactly. every day. And yeah. it's like, well, that's why that's why you don't notice because you, ha- you don't live at your normal potential anyways. There's no deficit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still think horse stance would work on, on the plane, too. I'm under-leveraging it. That one's that's – a, that's a power stance, dude. That's – Just that's you have a whole plane. aisle. You just get up and you're just like – what and just but like i guess if you went back to the yeah the like little like yeah what, what would you call that if the, the corridor for the flight attendants or something like that what do they call it yeah quarters no there's, some, there's quarters? a name for it yeah for sure. but yeah if you go back there there's usually like room mm-hmm. if the attendants don't kick you out what i have found they the, the real hack there's technically no rule that says you can't be back there they just don't want so, to because they yeah. want to do horse dance they want to do horse stance. Absolutely. Like, or they just out. want to talk shit. Yeah, I'm trying to talk shit about the lady in first class right now. Mm-hmm. I'm back here in economy. Oh, back. And he's with like, these look, fools. I'm not. <laughs> she's like, this is what I got to do with <laughs> See, this one. <what? laughs> I got to be back here in economy with this guy doing a horse stance back mm-hmm. here. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that the, uh, yeah, the real hack is just get into first class, right? I mean, <laughs> 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 where you just have like a bed or something. A massage chair. Those beds are nice. On yeah, those long flights, the ones that like, and you have your like your little your little tube. Those mm-hmm. ones are great. Only had it once. Yeah, only had it once, and it wasn't a completely different flight experience. Oh yeah, you're like, wow, this is enjoyable. If I could travel like this all the time, I'd fly all the time. Yeah, right, right. That's Never true. had it. Sounds great. It, the it, train it was completely changes it. Yeah, it's like train. Okay, the train was when we took our train from Seattle to Vancouver. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was the most enjoyable travel. I've had on, you know, on a constrained cart or car. Or Caboose? Yes, or something, whatever. Right? And you were doing handstands in the aisle. Yep. And people were ignoring you. Yes. Like, they're sitting there, and you're doing a handstand literally literally adjacent to them, and they're just like, 
eyes forward, just dead set forward, trains rocking. And I'm like, if it was me, I'd be like, hold up. I don't know how good your handstands are. <laughs> like, <laughs> take I think your I, yeah, This was here. before Snapchat. I'm sure it would have been on, like, TikTok. So it would have been like, oh, this guy, handstand on a plane. Yeah, yep. so handstands work because the, the, the space is less, but then the bales are worse if you fall into a crowd. That is, yeah, like, handstands on a plane little little risky if you hit like a bump or something because <laughs> there's no you have forward mm-hmm. and you have backwards mm-hmm. and that's it if you go mm-hmm. sideways you run into somebody and you, somebody's gonna get real mad at you right and yeah. everybody's wound tight <laughs> yeah. on planes yeah. dude i swear i'm like dude y'all need to loosen uh-huh. up okay is yeah it, tell you because they're all afraid it, you might be right about that and that makes me so sad yeah very very afraid people have been on we're not even to the scary part of flight like once we go into space then you have the right to be afraid That's yeah because I mean. like there is no bailout no <laughs> right there's no like there's no like oh we're gonna do a water landing and then like you get to go down the cool water slide like that doesn't happen in space all right there's no cool water slide there's just endless Oxygen. vacuum of entropy yep that's sad i don't want to go to space though. but mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> so so on the plane Justin's got pigeon in the bathroom <laughs> for his tip. bathroom pigeon pigeon stretch. Um, yeah, no, I mean if if you're washing your feet, at least in, you you stand, you're cleaning. Mm-hmm. So there's that. But I'm yeah. gonna go with the uh, um, ostrich aisle walk. <laughs> wow. Have you done that? Have you actually done that? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Like down the aisle doing as like the As long as your butt walk. is to the front of the plane, you should be okay. But if you're doing it like you're oh, walking yeah, right. to I the pilots. <laughs> so you got to be walking. <laughs> yeah, you need to be walking where people like aren't staring at your butt on the aisle. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't thinking of travel. Like you kind of get in a position where you're on the back where it's not that big of a deal. So oh, you guys yes, don't know. Place. Yeah. Because it, but yeah, I guess doing a full just like trip. Somebody has to lose <laughs> a bet and do that one. <laughs> so the Oscars Rock, you guys, is where like you, you you're you're standing up right yeah no so you would be yeah, standing up here and you would you bend at the hips your legs lock out you bend at your hips it's you like reach down one. underneath your feet like you're stretching your hamstrings and you start to like switch your booty and oh, you cannot flex the knee <laughs> and then the plate. you just come down <laughs> and you just start trotting like boom 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 boom, boom. <laughs> right so in the plane that's your butt is about you definitely- you definitely face got, height. You gotta be traveling backwards for that, because anybody that wants to like stare at your butt has to crane. <laughs> yeah, and then it's obvious that they're staring at your butt. But otherwise, it's just butt for like fifteen meters <laughs> yeah. down the aisle. As you, I mean, that's a that is a good one. Like that is the targeted so areas tight. you need to get. But yeah, you need to you need to go back and like so find acceptable a if the direction is down is towards the, the carpet oh, it's all acceptable it's just, <laughs> which one's the, which one's the most upsetting okay because okay. there's like a threshold of how much upset you can you know of the the atmosphere in the plane that's that's a good one all right so that one and then yeah mine's uh mine's gonna be squatting on the chair yeah squatting on the chair it's pretty solid yeah so you just like you take your shoes off and you you tuck your feet up and you like actually get into that like bottom end squat and then you take the belt and you run it around the front of your shins right by the ankle and then you kind of tighten it up and then you get yourself a nice little like squat position your knees are right there so you can prop up like head on there perfect spot. napping position yeah it's great to great to rotate through and then of course the flight attendants come by and they're like hey you need to put your seat belt <laughs> on it's technically on yeah. <laughs> and then they just leave you alone because they really because they're like i don't (laughs) they're like i don't know what to tell him yeah (laughs) because he's technically following all the rules Mm -hmm. but yeah and then once your uh once your toes start to fall asleep then you go back to sitting and you do like a little cross leggy thing Mm -hmm. if you've got neighbors that are nice Mm -hmm. yeah then you just rotate i like that one that one's the best if you have a hard time sleeping in a plane try that that the hack right there is is the seat belt to hold the shins in i never yeah. thought of that That's i learned really that uh killy Strett has has uh he he has it across his lap and he has you like oh uh, yeah uh, pin it yeah like uh square up your your hips and then use a t- seat belt to like latch them down so that you can relax after that mm. um i never use it for that so I like use active release for... therapy art like you pre- no, I like you see you your the the hips in a neutral position rather than that like that yeah tucked 
the yeah. whole flight, right? Yeah, so you get you get here, right, and you rotate the, the hips forward. Yep. So that your lumbar is not like pooping out your back. Yeah. And then you run the the seat belt across the top of the, the like, like issue wing. Press. Yeah. <laughs> and then you pin it down. Uh uh-huh. and then from there once it's like it's got to be like tight though yeah it's not like super uncomfortable tight because it's not sitting up here on your right on your intestinals gut. or anything right um and then and then you pin it down and then you can just like relax and it'll pin your hips down interesting that's yeah. not bad yeah, i never use it for that i just use it for for squatting or various. yeah because of the space of the island plane you could actually get the split squat in i think too which is something that i hadn't been using on flights before i'm gonna try that out next time and then i don't think it would be really in you know intrusive as far as people are like oh he's stretching that looks familiar to me right yeah you definitely still have to be this way though which is like kind of the the like awkward part is that if you're doing anything where like your butt is kind of sticking oh, out you want to do it in the like you want to stuff your leg in front of the people sitting next to you no no like no, guy no, in the middle no, seat like, has no, to like, take like half the quad no i'm saying like in the aisle facing towards the back of the plane yeah okay it right. like the benefit is nobody has the like discomfort of like ah, this guy's like the donk a donk just hanging mm-hmm. out here in the aisle because when you're in split squat your booty pops you know yeah but you know, some people might just be like nothing's happening on this flight <laughs> you get a little, oh. get a little entertainment all right <laughs> but if you thing. but if you flip around you're facing the back now you have the risk of eye contact <laughs> yeah it's a, definitely a power stance right you're just like <laughs> yeah i like it so, so you, some, you pick your poison uh, people staring at your butt without your knowledge or you make an eye contact with people while stretching so i think here i'm gonna unpack a little bit for for training tips the horse dance since since i started thinking about it now if you guys have done horse dance before there how many different like flavors usually the horse stand or horse dance flavor depends on the discipline you're studying right so sure. if you do yoga and they do horse dance but what do they call it in yoga is there another word? There's got to be another word for it. Come, we look at horse dance and yoga. Um, when you do it in martial arts, there you can kind of tell what style someone studies in order to just by looking at the horse dance. You can kind of tell whether it's Japanese style or, or you know whatever the, the level is. And then now people are using them more and more um, in movement culture. You know, is in there. And then as I was reading you know. in that, in what you know, what you know. You know. You know. You know, sorry, uh, you know, Midwestern yeah. slip in there. Yeah, some, some belt a load up. There you <laughs> go, and just you're doing your horse stance in movement culture. You want to there. Try to see it. Ooh, do you know how to the one on the right pronounce that? That is uh, Vata Yana Nasana. Vata Yana Nasana. Yana Sana. Add an extra syllable there. There's nothing Sana esque about the horse stance. As a matter of fact, sauna would be the worst place to do a horse dance. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure that's a little kind of a lot, a lot of A's. So the the key takeaways are that if you're doing it for um, mobility, you can actually use the horse dance to help you get the splits, and that's the middle split. And that's mm-hmm. a secret that a lot of people don't know is that um, if you and here's here's the tip with that one, and I think this one I got a little bit from. I did see a yoga practitioner talking about this one. Um, and then I've also seen it done by um, uh, some of the mentors I've had in stretching. Uh, and that is to keep the, um, the hips, the, what's that? the crease of the hips below the knee in the position. And that is how you know that you're working on mobility versus just the isometric strength of holding horse stance. So if you do horse stance and you lock the legs out, um, you don't have the same stretch on the on the parts of the uh, groin and pelvis that are going to get you that that middle split. So oftentimes when you're training and you guys are training, if you look down, you'll see your hips are way above your knees. Doesn't mean it's not doing anything, but if but you can in theory get all the way down to like a middle split by training at the end range of motion. As long as your measure is, I'm going to keep the hips below the knees. And that works all the way down to like the last 10% of the middle split, um, which we all know is super the hardest part. Right. And at that point, you no longer have that. Things are pretty much locked out. But that and building your splits that way through the horse stance is the difference between having like that. I guess I wouldn't call it a ballet split. Do you guys know like sometimes like girls or girls are particularly this way? Or I've noticed that like 
heavier guys are this way, maybe just because more weight over the hips can just like fall into the middle split, but they can't control the different heights through flexion. So it's just like, boom, they can get to the end range. But if you're like, hey, hold it in the and middle. A and B, but yeah. Then, yeah, nothing in between. They don't have the strength. They don't have the controlled strength in between. So they don't, so they're more vulnerable there. And then they don't, they can't actually in many ways use that um, range of strength and movement as much. Yeah, I don't, I spent a long time chasing middle splits and then realized didn't really care that much. But yeah, but you're at a certain point. Like I bet now if you warmed up, you'd be at 90% split. Yeah. So a lot of people can't get their hips even in the horse stance Mm -hmm. to the height of their knees. No matter how narrow their feet are, they have to get almost into like an actual squat. Like we would use a precision squat in parkour, but before then. So you're saying horse stance in the airport, if you travel a lot, is your like your quick tip. You're like, you're prepping for the flight and you get a little bit of middle splits like work on the outside. I wouldn't wait for that to be the first time because the delayed onset muscle soreness for the return flight would probably be <laughs> pretty excruciating. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we got a layover or something. Yeah, I'm saying that and I'm also, I actually, I'm gonna go so far as to say that if you don't have some degree of middle split, you're really missing out. Yep. I think you're gonna have back pain. I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah you need like, well, what, what, what percentage we consider this 100% and standing zero? What percentage would you say? If you want to get really mathematical, we can do what zero is it and 180. But I think the way I've heard it measured before is is the seven or eight step, meaning you're taking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out with your feet and then be able to still keep hips below knees. Hmm. I think that's a pretty good measure. That is highly unscientific, but it okay. is. It's but it's going to be relative to your proportions. But that's why it's highly <laughs> unscientific. It's better but. than like I. So I would say, but you got to measure feet apart, right? Because that's really what the measurement is for how, but in the distance is going to be different because people's legs are different. No, I, I'm just talking like depth. Like, what do you think? Like, a, so let's say somebody's listening right now and they're like, well, mm-hmm. I can, I can maybe get to like, if helpful like standing a is sumo 100%. deadlift kind of position. Yeah. Like so what, feet together, what's the depth that I should be able to get to with the middle splits at, to consider myself at the bare minimum. Degrees of bend out from the hip, starting with feet together, like standing straight up as being like 100% extended. Mm -hmm. And then moving out in a radius, you're basically looking at the, at eventually getting to the, essentially the nine o'clock and three o'clock positions for Mm -hmm. the legs. Maybe where should your feet be in the- Yeah, exactly. In the clock that is your pelvis. Yeah, what degree? (laughs) So like, let's say that somebody gets to 90 degrees, right? Which is full, yeah, full, yeah, you're like that, but well, that would be. It's just a V. It's a V. V. Let's just flip the person upside down. The ground's up top. And we'll say 180 is full. 180 is a full split. So, and they're like, I can get to 90, and that's where I say, is that a good enough bare minimum? Mm Hmm. No. This, I, no. I feel like 90 is like bare minimum to be. Athletic. And I wouldn't, you know, what I'm yeah. saying even further is that I wouldn't even, I would count the measure as the degree of split with the hips underneath the knees now. Cause I think that that really shows. Yeah. So bring it in, Colin. Let's see if you can get it. So yeah, Colin's going to demo so. here. All right, a little lower because your hips, bring your feet in closer together. Bring your feet in a little bit closer Boots, together. Bro. A little bit Boots. more. That's feet awesome. up, feet in just a little bit more. Boots. The feet in just a little bit more, sir. All right, good. Now chest upright. And that's yeah. going to increase the load. Not bad. So I think that's near acceptable. Yeah. So that's what? How many? What? No. But see, this changes yeah, greatly like because he's ten. going in. When he sits down, it's completely different than being in that straddle. Mm-hmm. I yeah. think this is going to, I think that, that'll change the angles. The degree, how far your feet are apart. So that angle. What? Yeah, yeah I, I guess. Yeah, and then you guys the, are thinking and then the squat, horse stance. And I was thinking just the squat. true split. A true, true split, sports, which is straight legs, mm-hmm. so that you can hold. Mm. I mean, anything, anything that's that's close to like, you know, probably. I think she's got to be above ninety, yeah. right? I think it's got to be. I think it's got to be close mm. to like just start one thirty. Yeah, I would agree. One thirty, one hundred thirty degrees. One thirty is where I feel pretty strong. I think after, but like that's your minimum. 
Yeah, need I'm going to say that we need a pendulum. So I'm sure there's a, a math. A split math? Yes, yeah, so you just hang like a belt with a ball and you just measure the time. That's that Chinese Qigong stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's intense <laughs> stuff there. That <laughs> takes years of training before you're hanging weights from that. That's there. loaded, progressive <laughs> stretching for sure. Someone needs to give us a, a protractor for that. I would say I would that like I would personally feel like it's it's reasonable and athletic for someone to go to a to work towards a middle split that's somewhere between eight and twelve inches off the ground, like like uh, pelvis from the ground, glutes from the ground in the middle split. What if you're like twelve feet tall? Yeah, I really don't. I don't think it matters because what really matters, really matters. the angle is completely different. Yeah, the longer the legs are. It, the height. That's why I think your, I, your butt and the ground degrees. Definitely degrees yeah, I'm talking about distance most. between the butt and the ground because I think that a lot of this has to do with, um, like hip flexion and the extension, like the abduction of the of the leg. Mm-hmm. I think that you're defending against. I think if you get that low, you have a really broad range of strength. That probably means the rest of your, you know lumbar pelvis glutes groin are in a, and if you could hold that under load meaning that's why i think that has to be a thing too is you have to be able to hold that for like 15 to you know 30 seconds or something to show that you actually have control of that range of strength if you have that the chances that you slip out on something um or that there's some greater benefit you're missing through pelvic mobility when you're in a bottom of a squat is probably there's probably no deficit like most of the athletes that i've seen who or even in even in martial arts, who've done a lot of kicking and whatnot, who can at least get there, rarely have other sorts of pelvis problems. And I really don't. I don't have a ton either of mm-hmm. pelvis problems. It's a little bit of hip flexor tension. And when you're you require more than that, then think about anything. Think about like a step out to the side and a slip on wet grass or ice or even just someone's gross sweat on the air track. You know, it's like right. That's going to send you out and the chances. And then and then. You know, if you ever want to kick, yeah, <clears throat> for any yeah. reason, I thought that range helps. And when we don't do that, it actually just we're making those accommodations for range in our spine somewhere, right? So if you're going to do a flip and you kick out of a flip, but you don't have like you know good mobility, you're you're going to round at the back, and you're just going to have to make that work in other ways that that put you more at risk. Yep. It's yeah. Or, yeah, it is definitely. I mean, they. Any self-respecting athlete will know that like mobility and mobility work is going to be like it's going to pay dividends in the long run, right? It's not like you're going to work on splits and suddenly you like magically perform better the next day or something like that. But it is it's it's insurance on the long term that you're not going to have any sort of you know. So I like um, recurring injuries. I like the uh, range of strength stuff by um, Flexible on. Uh, uh, his name's Jeff. I forget his last name. On, uh, he has a he has a he has a program podcast. But his whole thing is is he he you know he lifts. He likes he likes strength. But um, and this is more of an Eastern approach too. Is just that the what you can load onto you is as important, if not, it's more important that you can also load that weight through your full range of of strength. So mobility training becomes strength training, and through that mindset. And I like that better because it gives some lateral progression for strength training, aside from just like, I'm going to put another plate on my back. Yeah. Because we all know that there's a big difference between, like Jesse has a very beautiful ATG back squat, right? Mm-hmm. Ours to grass, right? Very beautiful back squat. If someone tries to acquire that additional range in their back squat, but they have not been training to do that under load for all practical purposes, it's a new movement mm-hmm. because that range has just never been under low. So you're taking, you're taking stuff all the way to the bottom and further. And even if they gain mobility, if they don't do that while loading it at the same time, they load on the new weight, they can injure themselves because they're not used to taking that load under that further bottom. So what we mean by that is when you go into yours, um, then you're loading your PRs, your personal records with the most weight you can lift all the way through your complete end range of motion, which mm-hmm. for you is, you could pretty much take a break at the bottom, right? Yeah. You sit down, and if you had to, you just stay. You're at the end range of motion. You're upright, chest is upright, hips are open, and you're sitting essentially with your hamstrings compressed to your calf, right? It's actually, yeah, like my favorite way to like warm up for back squats. 
is to just throw like 135 pounds on there and just go to the bottom and, and sit. sit. I've done that before too. And then the most obnoxious thing, I was doing it at a Globo gym and people kept asking me if they need, if I needed help. <laughs> That's why, I, that's why if, I had, if I had to do it at a Globo gym, I would ab, like absolutely have my phone in front of me so that people are like, oh, he's just he's just hanging out down there. Because, yeah, otherwise it looks like they're like, does this guy need Bro, a I had someone come and pull the bar off my back at the Fort Collins Club. Or not Fort Collins Club, uh, the uh, uh, Old Town. Oh, yeah, Old Tech. Yeah. Old Tech, yeah. Because I had my headphones on, I wasn't listening, right? Because I was like, oh. And also, like, like, what the? Bro, you need help, bro. Because I was in the squat rack, so he just pulled it off and then put it on the, the safety bars. And and I was like, like, oh, I thought chunk. you were stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like under 95 pounds? Yeah, Come on, bro. bro. Come on. Dude, that's what I, lo- I do love people in the gym. As annoying as it is when someone tries to give you advice, this accounts for just parkour techniques as well. Like, Everyone feels like they just want to share the like secret thing that they have, or they're just always looking for a moment to like help someone else out. It, in terms of physical activity, it mm-hmm. feels like people are really giving in that way. Sometimes I don't think it's coming from the right place, but it's maybe ego. Yeah, like but it does. It, it's kind of nice that someone like sees you there and is like, I don't like. I'm not gonna assume this guy's stuck in that position. Right. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. I'm gonna go help him out. It's I mean, again, it's annoying for someone who, who's. But imagine that so as long. a facility. So think of this mindset because I've I've kind of worked for some of those gyms before, and it literally is this, this sort of feral experiment. It's like a reality TV show. We're just gonna let people swipe their cards, and yep. they're gonna come in, and whatever happens, happens. <laughs> right. With all these different arts and different relationships that exist on the floor, and it's like. Man, you throw a shower in the mix. <laughs> She's crazy. So, yeah, I, I would feel that way. I think that this is also another little hack up here with the seatbelt hack that I've recently um, worked on when is that if I'm really lazy and I'm trying to work on, let's say, something like pancake split, where I'm working on that, um, that groin um, and glute and high hamstring flexibility, and I don't want to spend a bunch of casual time listening to a podcast in order to warm up my pancake to do my strength work in it work in it and the pancake is you guys is when your legs are straddled you're sitting on the ground then you're you lean the pelvis forward and you flatten out right um i will just do a set of yeah like 135 back squats because when i yeah. mindfully go to the bottom every every rep opens up very quickly um the the pelvis so that's my little like pancake split hack too so i wonder how many people are doing that that because this is again this is with the back squat if you had the mindset of i care about range of strength not just how what the numbers are i'm putting up yeah that changes the dimensions of how you train well yeah i i think that's that's a big thing because i i admittedly don't like i don't do horse stance um i don't do a ton of pancake except at like night when i'm kind of bored um in which case i still prefer like legs up to walk because it's lazier mm-hmm. um <laughs> but i do a ton of back squats right and I always do them with that mentality of like the maximum amount of range I can with the most amount of weight that I can handle for that range of motion. Um, but yeah, I, I would wager that, you know, give me a couple minutes to warm up and I could probably hit 160 degrees in a split, you know, in the middle splits without ever having to work on it. Right. Um, but I don't think most people are training their weightlifting with that same mentality. They aren't. But I think that's I think that's going to shift because the longevity of training for load is not sustainable. I mean, some people do it, but it's to be very mindful. And you always have to stay within that realm of what you're comfortable with. Because if you train back squat for 30 years to a certain degree, and then on the 31st year decide, I'm going to go down another four inches. But how are you going to go down another four Because a lot of people, when they do back squats, are stopping for what counts. Oh, you mean not the, the, yeah, the hip crease below knees. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Yeah. They're just, and they're not even doing that. Like you go to, speaking of global gyms, you go to global gyms, you're going to see Quarter, quarter quarter squat curtsy yeah. squats a, all day long like stopping at that, at that like hip crease and knees that's like that's so much harder like when you're under heavy loads like you load up 300 pounds there and trying to stop at that point and not go lower is so hard i'm like just just lower the whole thing to the bottom come all the way to the top it's very simple yeah but they're not but there's no degree of honesty there because the honest, but because people were loading the weight on that they lifted in but, high school, at least they remember lifting, which I, probably wasn't true either. <laughs> I do think that in, in some degree, though, some people just don't have the range of motion yet to get there, right? So it's yeah. I think it's, 
you would suggest that if that's not your range of motion for a back squat, then horse stance would be a really great way for you to gain that extra range of motion. And then when you go back to the squat rack to experiment with lighter weights, of course, at, for that full range. Yeah, and if you're doing isometric con- contraction in the horse stance for 15, which 30 seconds a you minute, should be. which you should be, I think any decent athlete, let's talk about that. How long should you be able to sit in a proper horse stance as a decent and well-prepared you know, athlete or mover to say that you have some confidence in it? Like what, what point is it a deficit? Well, yeah, lower dominant athlete. I would imagine if you're a, you know, like a pitcher or something, you probably don't need to, but I, I use no, the no, term, non-specialized. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying, saying if you yeah, squat, use the term athlete is like, let's say you back squat, you clean to back squat, then you should probably be able to score a stance for some degree if you're doing it right. So yeah. How I long, would, what do you think like this? I don't know. Cause I, last time I did horse stance was probably years ago. Yeah, like 30 seconds. Yeah. 30 seconds. 30 a minute, seconds. Probably. Got it, yeah. I you yeah. do 20 to 30 seconds with oh, really? my kiddos. That's lower than I was expecting. Well, I mean, I was expecting like a minute. Yeah. I mean, you'll tell right, you could tell right like, away when something like the second, like five seconds in, you'll be able to tell if, if someone they, has if a, they are in a deficit. There. It's like it's like L sits. Like when you get in an L sit, you can tell somebody hasn't done an L sit in a while, and they just immediately start like. Yeah, so you get the that little cockroach, I mean, like, that dying cockroach shake. Oh, really? I feel like if you can get into L sit and shake, you're. <laughs> Better than ninety percent of the people. Oh, oh yeah. That's right. oh, yeah. yeah, okay, that's, well, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Just can you get in? Or how about yeah? yeah. How about a, be, a better example is is support hold on the rings. Yep. Right. There you like, go, can yeah. you get into support hold on the rings? And almost everybody starts doing this thing like immediately, right? But people who and who have done ring work in some moderate capacity will jump up there, and you'll see mm-hmm. them hold this position pretty stable for a while. Mm-hmm. I even like to swing in that position. Yeah. Be like Iron Man. <laughs> 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 that's great yeah so i guess the, okay, the so key message seconds. that i would want people to take listening now is is just if you haven't already open your mind to lateral progressions of strength which means deeper range of motion which means not just thinking about putting up the numbers but also thinking about the intention of the movement and even the shape like if you're going I, again we're not i'm not obsessed with what the shape of a squat should look like because we can see strongmen lifting up these ridiculous stones and neural sheep in ireland or something like that and just having the most rounded awkward posture ever but they're familiar with that that mm-hmm. range of motion because they've trained yes progressively in that exact range of motion correct yeah. it, this is where being obsessed with having a perfect midline can hurt you because <laughs> you're always like very strong and perfect in that position and then you come out of it for any reason under load and there's just no there's no variation you've just hyper specialized one particular position mm-hmm. looking looking for them gains there but when well, you put yourself more at risk because we don't exist in those positions right we don't yeah, live we our don't. life or play our sports or play with our kids in those positions mm-hmm. right like you're always always in some sort of funky position so yeah absolutely training a full range of motion under some progressive load whether it be horse stance and splits or an L sit or planche, these things are just should be incorporated in your training. Mm-hmm. Right? I agree. Yeah. I agree. Any other tips for back squat? So how did you build up your back squat? Jesse, you've got a pretty good back squat. You don't have a traditional power lifting background. You're parkour to the core. So how did you build your back squat? What was your rep sequence? What did the story look like? Uh, I think it's been like three years maybe four years that i've been like regularly doing strength training like year round Mm. um like cyclical strength and power training um and honestly it's i i could definitely pull up all of my programming back then but it's all like trial and error and if i'd redo it i'd change a ton of stuff Mm. but for the most part it's just doing something related to that movement right um so like back squats for me have always been like there's a minimum two times a week i will do back squat right that's just that's just it anything on top of that is is like a beneficial and the reason for the back squat it doesn't have to be that same for everybody but back squat translates the best to parkour and the sports that i enjoy so that's why that's the one now add on to that when i originally was training back squats like my mentors and coaches had me training uh uh front squat 
high bar back squat and low bar back squat separately and the foot positions were different Mm -hmm. um in parkour it seems like and you tell me have you experimented with bringing your feet in closer because it just seems to me like it might be better off for the parkour athlete who i think is the more natural athlete to keep their feet closer together whereas some traditional strength coaches would want you in that almost nearly a horse stance back squat yeah like right just outside shoulder width or shoulder width. yeah yeah i would absolutely if you have the ankle dorsiflexion i would recommend that you bring your feet in closer um so you're not dumping the weight back right the tail doesn't round out you don't dump the weight back yeah like the closer you are as a parkour athlete on the back squat would probably translate the better because that's where we jump from we almost always jump in this like foot together or like you know one fist distance between our feet but the truth is like if you don't have the ankle dorsiflexion for that um, and you're an adult, you're not going to get it. So you just have to pick the narrowest that you can. I'm absolutely not this like super narrow because I just don't have that ankle dorsiflexion. So it's a it's a matter of I also would recommend doing front squat rather than back squat. But you have to find what's the most efficient route in order for me to be able to do the same amount of weight and get the same stimulus in that foot position on a front squat will take me years of work. And I'm like, I got stuff to do, a life right. to live, and I want to have fun. So it's high bar instead, and it's slightly wider. It's probably two fifties. And so it's deadlift yeah. position. Yeah, for Almost me, because that's the most efficient position mm-hmm. for me. It's the narrowest I can get without having to spend a ton of time and energy trying to eke out an extra half inch on dorsiflexion on my ankles. It's also closer to the movement in parkour at precision jumps. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I do think and that. two foot jumping. The fisty, too. like one fist between the feet. So if you take your feet, for those of you listening, if you take your feet and you kind of like stand up, um, and then you take make a fist and put a fist in between the knuckle of your big toe, that's kind of like where you would jump in precision from. So I like that conversation because I think that's, I personally believe that's the ideal um, precision position, both for takeoff and for landing, for yeah. jump position, for takeoff and landing, even though there are circumstances where you, where you want to be able to, um, like get hit in narrow landings, right? We want to have the competence, at least in short or mid range to be able to stick precisions with your feet touching almost. Yeah. But, yeah. But jumping that way, if you think about your hips, right? So you, you want them to be straight because that's going to be the most direct translation. But if your feet go in, you now actually have an an angle that goes out. So you actually end up dumping some power when you're jumping from feet together Mm. because of that. I would agree. And because we jump, we don't, in in lifting or in some sort of strength where your foot's flat, that actually would help you because your foot's, because the the feet are in and you're actually able to generate more torque, right? Because you have essentially a bigger windup. So you have this outside angle coming narrow. But in jumping, that doesn't work for you because your heel's off the ground. So torque's pretty irrelevant when you're standing on one point on each foot, which is the ball of the foot. So it wouldn't benefit you in that case. But. I also think there may be a little too much um, hate on natural valgus, like the knees mm. coming in a little bit. Yeah. I think that, yeah, I mean, if we look at pro pro players and stuff, and I've had some other people expose this idea before too, but I just remember in martial arts, like when I trained Wushu, like it was normal to train internal rotation to the drop, to the, to the ground. Like it was not, you weren't trying to, you know, do the heaviest thing in that position, but it was standard to collapse the knee in internal rotation and the foot would be flat until the knee actually hit the ground. And then, and you would load that in stance work. Um, And I think what that helped me with was prepare my knees for internal rotation. But I think that happened. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the fitness community now is just like any freaking deviation from absolute external rotation in the knee. I think it's gone too far. Like I've experienced more pain from trying to never let my knees come in than I ever did from having a little bit of, of valgus in, in a jump or in landing or something like that. It, it might, it might just be, I think, your orbit. yeah, I think on, if we were to take height drops yeah, I think the one fist is and good. go into valgus yeah. upon the landing like immediately then yeah that's... yeah probably don't want to do that Ooh. Right, pro- but yeah i mean like if you're if you're running you're running a line and you hit attack to change directions your knee's not going to be externally rotated on attack right it's actually going to be pretty parallel and your femur may actually end up kind of coming up just a bit it's not going to kill you 
You should be able to handle it. Not you should be able to handle it. If your if your yeah. freaking meniscus shoots out of your mouth because of that, <laughs> like the like the alien coming out of your stomach, like yes, your meniscus then, is reaching out. That's a problem. Like you probably need to be a little bit. Those ninety ninety sits are nice for that. If you so, have like knee issues. Yeah, I, feel, I actually feel like those knee injuries are from people uh, changing the direction that they're running too. Whereas I feel like if you're collapsing and it's just vertical. I feel like it's something that you're pretty used to, whether you're lifting, you're squatting, or you're jumping. Mm. But I feel like my hips are stacked over knees. Yeah, so yeah. I feel like the direction, yeah, that impact is a little more formal or formalized for your knee. But then when you're doing quick cuts like on grass, when those knee injuries happen a lot, that's that's a that angle is a little bit. It's going to be quite a bit different, and it's going to be something I feel like that knee's not quite ready for. That's when I see it, is when people, I, so you see it in kicking and tricking, that you're moving laterally, right? Yeah. And so I think that, and plus a little bit of torque on the, on the knee from the twisting, and that's when I, I, I'll feel that when I, if I land bad. So. Yeah, I think that lateral stability could be trained more in parkour as a, as a drill. There's probably some good drills for that. And then also the, uh, I think the lateral stability of the ankle has a lot too mm-hmm. when you get in there we're pretty good at forwards and backwards but a lot of athletes miss that like most my sprints have been lateral point, actually that like ankle ankle yep and so yeah. why I've, I've trained what i've done to kind of help that a little bit is i train overhead squat with and i try and work in my overhead squats to get my feet together to where i'm doing overhead squat with with the like tight precision position I mean feet are touching then going into that full position and I've had to work up to that. That was not something that came yeah, that's, naturally. That's a pretty cool position if you if you can get there. And I think, but I feel that that one actually does affect my, my ankles too. Like I'm actually, lo- I feel it the most actually in strengthening the lateral side of my ankle, the exterior side, when I'm at the bottom of that. That's the, what it'll get me. And that may just be years of scar tissue from jacking on my ankles or if it's, if there, there might actually be a, might be some sort of benefit to that. Keep us tuned on that experiment. Yeah, so I would love to have the most badass ankles. I think if I could, I think before I go for the uh, um, robot legs, I'd probably end up going for the pretty happy with my legs and knees. My ankles, I'm kind of like, yeah. I think if you go for robot leg, you kind of have to replace the. You want the whole thing? You got to replace the whole thing. You can't have like robot femur and have human ankles. You don't think that's just a recipe? Yeah, you got to start from the ground up. Yeah, definitely got to replace the ankle and feet and then up to the knee. Then yeah, that's yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, just do like you where, just do ankle. Yeah, right. Tip bib to tip bib to titanium. Maybe. Yeah. Are you thinking the tip bibs to like subpar as a as a bone structure? Just go all the way up to the knee. Well, then you got to do the knee too. So that's what I'm saying. It's like you might as well just do the whole leg, just straight to hip, straight to hip. Ooh, man, I would just love more ankle flexion. Would love it. I'm pretty sure if you uh, if you're willing to suffer, you could probably ask a doctor to shave, shave some, it off. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you think you have the Thanks. bone bro- the bone block thing? I just know that. I don't know the technical <laughs> term for that. <laughs> for that, or just I don't even know if it's a pathology. Like Ryan had, right? Ryan yeah, yeah, and a couple of people have had it. We had Kurt had it. Ryan Ryan had it, and also mm. our coach. Uh, who or, I swear another coach had it. Can't remember who it was off the top of my head. But yeah, yeah, can't because there's actually bone in the way. It just doesn't go over. Just Freaking doesn't go bones. God. Always in the way. Right? But anyways, thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, appreciate you listening. If you are uh, watching us on YouTube, hello. Wave hello, guys. Oh, it's a holiday, too. So, wish a happy holiday. I guess you need a oh, it, well, yeah. I, I guess actually when this drops, yeah, it will be a holiday. Right. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. hey, uh, happy holidays. Um, Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever holiday you celebrate. They're all friggin' awesome. I don't care. Just have fun. <laughs> um, be merry and celebrate that the end of 2020. <laughs> oh, yes. Bittersweet. Um, oh, 2020. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if you're watching us, uh, you can listen to us on any of your major podcast platforms. And if you are listening to us, uh, please tune in every now and then on the YouTube channel and uh, see our faces. Thanks so much. Uh, leave a comment, like, subscribe, all that. You know, Ask us about them, stuff. these squat questions. I feel like some of you might already have some of these things and un- have un- unrealized strengths. Absolutely. And the comment section is always open. So please, if you got questions about anything or if you got comments, uh, let us know. We'd love to hear. Thanks so much. Catch you next time.